Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is David Christopher Kaufman, and I'm very pleased to be the moderator, moderator and host for today's webinar, which is called Iron Swords War, Strategic Analysis and Future Scenario. Uh, for those of you who might not know me, I am David Christopher Kaufman. I'm a features editor and columnist for the New York Post. I am also an adjunct fellow at the Tel Aviv Institute, and I'm a very proud alumnus of Tel Aviv University, and I'm coming to you from New York City. Um, today is about a lot. Uh, it's a lot of. I'm a newspaper man. There's a lot of news about Israel right now. Um, today is about understanding uh, facts and to better understand Hamas and their mindset. To truly understand the complexities of the situation that Israel faces, one must understand the nuances of the Palestinians and the nuances of Hamas, with whom Israel is now engaged truly in a, in a very serious war. Uh, I'm very pleased to be welcoming Dr. Michael Michael uh, Milstein, a renowned expert in the Palestinian arena. He is the head of the Palestinian Studies Forum at the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies at Tel Aviv University. He's also a senior and an analyst at the Institute for Policy and Strategy at IDC in Herzliya, also in Israel. He is the former advisor on Palestinian affairs to the coordinator of government activities in the territories, uh, known as COGAT, and he headed the Department for Palestinian Affairs in Israel's military intelligence for over 20 years. Uh, bottom line, he understands the Palestinian mindset more than anyone, and he can help us, us at home understand it better as well. He is the author of three books and has published dozens of articles about strategic developments in the Middle East and the Palestinian arena. Uh, he's going to give a uh, presentation and tell us a lot. If you have questions for Dr. Milstein, please uh, write them in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible following the presentation. And now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Milstein. Welcome. Thank you very much, David. Thank you for having me. It's an honor for me, and I'm very glad to be uh, to be here. Um, before getting uh, into this, uh, it, it, it's not less than historic uh, point or historic uh, issue. I mean, the uh, the uh, Iron Swords uh, War. Uh, I just want to explain how I'm, how I'm going to uh, build my presentation. I will start it uh, with uh, general data. I do uh, believe that uh, we cannot uh, really uh, promote any kind of, uh, of serious strategic analysis or understanding without sharing the same or the common data uh, numbers about, about reality. Then we will uh, try to get deep into, the, uh, into, the, uh, uh, into reality and to, uh, to, uh, uh, to look in a, in a very unique manner about uh, the current situation and to ask uh, questions about the nature of the current situation and the impact of the uh, of this uh, war on Israel and of course in the end to look forward and to uh, analyze or or ask ourselves what will be the scenarios or what will be the uh, the uh, uh, future of uh, Israel the Palestinians the whole Middle East and actually the whole world so uh, I'll start uh, by elaborating uh, my presentation. Sorry. Only one moment. Professor, while we wait, yeah, you said that you've had you've been speaking with the media a lot already about uh, the UN decision. So we'll, we'll get to that when you're done. We'll get to that when you're done. Now, now you can see the presentation, right? Yep. Great. So as I as I told you, I, I do think that any kind of analysis should begin with uh, with data. 
and here mainly we we need to to know the uh, the uh, information about mainly demography uh, between the river and the sea. We need to uh, to uh, uh, know some basic details. First of all, when we are speaking about Jews and Arabs here uh, in the whole area of Eretz Israel, in the state of Israel, we are speaking about approximately. 7.5 million Jews and 1.65 million Arabs. All of them are citizens. 1.3 million of them are Muslims and the rest are Druze and Christians. In Gaza Strip, the main thing, the main air arena we're going to speak about, we're speaking about 2.2 million people and of course about zero Jews. There were Jews till 2005, the withdrawal of Israel from Gaza, but right now we're speaking about 99.99% of Muslims. All of, uh, all of them are, are Sunni uh, Muslims. In the West Bank, we're speaking uh, uh, about uh, almost 3 million uh, three million uh, Palestinians and a half a million uh, Israelis living acro uh, across the, the green line. Uh, and of course, uh, we're, we, we also speak uh, about, uh, about East Jerusalem, uh, the capital, uh, sorry, Jerusalem, the capital of uh, Israel. And this place, this site actually reflects one of the most complicated issues of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In the capital of Israel, only 60% of, uh, of the population are citizens. 40% of them are residents. They are not citizens. And we're speaking about Palestinians who twice in the, uh, thir in the last 30 years voted for the Palestinian parliament, but they cannot for uh, vote for the Knesset. And we will speak about, about it later. And now we will uh, uh, focus We will focus uh, uh, in Gaza, uh, of course, the arena of the of the current war. In Gaza, we're speaking, as I, as I mentioned before, about 2.2 million people. It's not important only to understand how many Palestinians are living today, but also what is the uh, what is the rate uh, of uh, growth among uh, among Palestinians. And uh, when you, you are checking, for example, the uh, the demography of the uh, Palestinians in Gaza. 20 years ago, they were 1 million people, Palestinians in Gaza. Today, we're speaking about 2.2 million. And according to a lot of assessments, mainly UN assessments, in 2035 or 2037, it's going to be 4 million uh, people in this, you know, 365 kilometers with no infrastructure and no water and no electricity, no beds in hospitals or rooms uh, in schools. I do think that it's going to be a nightmare. And by the way, not only for, for the Palestinians, but also for the Israelis. 66% of Gaza, uh, of Gaza uh, residents, they belong to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, Professor, we're having a hard time hearing you. I'm looking at some of the questions here for the press when we get back, and these are great. You know, I think that one of the most um, he's having he's having some, some technical difficulties, so I just want to let you know that we're trying to get him back, um, and we will get him back because that's what we do. Um, so just please hold tight. Um, and I'm just looking at some of the questions, and there are questions that I'm interested in as well. I really want to ask the professor as well. You know, uh, we have a question out there from Moti Levy asking about UNRWA and the status of the Palestinians as refugees over 75 years. Um, the fact that Palestinians, particularly in Gaza, um, but everywhere have been considered refugees uh, in a way that no other population has been considered refugees. And uh, 
you know, that's, that's, we often talk about this, this, you know, intractable refugee situation with the Palestinians and how it only goes into sort of feeding this, uh, this kind of war machine that we see coming out of Gaza uh, into Israel. Um, so what can be done about perhaps reclassifying uh, these folks as refugees and how this unending refugee situation perpetuates the conflict that we are in today. Um, so that's, of course, really interesting. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, we have a question about um, the fact that 70% of Palestinians uh, support Hamas and how in the context of this overwhelming support of Hamas, and the fact that Hamas has been so uh, vocal and strident about uh, their desire to destroy Israel, how do we uh, turn this population into an ally or at least into a partner? How do we form a partnership with a population, the Palestinians uh, in Gaza and of course in the West Bank, when they so overwhelmingly want to destroy Israel have made that so clear? So is there is there an opportunity to turn the Palestinians into uh, allies or into partners um, in the considering that so many of them are so uh, vocally uh, opposed to the existence of Israel? How do you work with somebody who's so vocally opposed to your existence? Um, another question about um, the Rafah operation, Rafiah, and why um, it has taken so long for Israel to, to take action in Rafah and Rafiah. Um, we all know that there has been a lot of opposition by the U.S. to uh, uh, Israel moving into Rafiah and really finishing the job. Is also ties into the hostage situation. Is there a way to truly end the operation in Rafiah, which would end the operation in Gaza, and still in any way keep the hostages alive? So that's a very complicated situation. I was on a, a, a Zoom chat like this uh, two weeks ago with somebody who just as knowledgeable as a professor. Uh, oh, the professor's back. Professor, you are back. Amazing. Welcome. I see he is back, guys. Just give us one more second and we'll get back to him. He's the real expert. I'm I'm just here to keep things going. Uh, give me one second. He is back. Give me one second, folks. There he is. So sorry. You know, uh, only after Kelly spoke with me, I realized that I spoke for about 10 minutes to myself. Uh, okay, Professor, I'm turning it back to you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm. I'm. First of all, I, I'm really sorry for the uh, this uh, uh, for this and. Uh, Sorry. Uh, I would, David. I I was disconnected from the beginning. Uh, I don't believe so. I believe we got quite a few of your slides going. So I think you can pick up from. I believe slide three. Okay, so let's turn to the uh, to uh, to uh, the uh, the uh, uh, analysis about about the war. I think that uh, this is the uh, the best. Uh, this is the most important uh, thing. And um, actually, when we're speaking about the war, I uh, I always say that many Israelis make mistake when they describe this war. I mean the the uh, the uh, Iron Swords War as an operation or round of escalation, because this is one of the most uh, important points in the history of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, when you're checking the numbers, uh, the data regarding this uh, conflict, you, you find out that, first of all, from the Israeli or the Jewish point of view, there was no, no such a bloody day in the history of the, of the conflict. There was no one day in 100 years of the conflict that so many Israelis, most of them Jews, but not only, were killed in one day. Not in 73, not in the Second Intifada, and not in 48. And there was no, no uh, uh, such a broad invasion of uh, external player, external force into Israeli territory like, like uh, the one who took place, uh, which took place on October the 7th. 
1973, there was an invasion of the Egyptian and the Syrian army, but this invasion was not to, Israel, to the state of Israel, but to Sinai and the Golan Heights. In, from the Palestinian point of view, you also speak about unprecedented uh, event. You're speaking about, and I will I will immediately uh, uh, shed a light on the on the uh, question of the number of casualties. But we, we right now know that there are much more casualties than than in any other conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. Much more from, uh, than the uh, the first in, uh, Nakba, you know, of forty eight. So many Palestinians today, they, for example, consider the current uh, war as the real Nakba and the Nakba of 48 as the, uh, the minor uh, Nakba. In order to, uh, uh, to understand the, uh, the, uh, uh, the current war, I think that we need to understand how the Israelis thought uh, before the uh, the war and what was their their uh, perception about Hamas and we, here we are speaking about a very popular term in, in Israel the conceptia of course it's from Greek or Latin but the meaning is is the prominent uh, uh, pattern of thinking the prominent uh, conception or perception about uh, about the uh, the enemy and uh, originally it was taken from 1973. The conceptia of 1973 was that was that uh, there is no chance that the Egyptians and the Syrians will open the, a, a war. And here, in the in the two years before October the seventh, there was another kind, a new uh, kind of of conceptia, conceptia that was uh, uh, common to political decision makers, heads of uh, security uh, uh, organizations, but also people from the media and from the academia. In a very short manner, the the uh, the conceptia was based on on some uh, some uh, some uh, uh, arguments or or, uh, or uh, sayings. First of all, Hamas, according to many people here in Israel, was a ruling party, and uh, as a ruling party, uh, was very much focused on uh, economic or civil uh, fields, and therefore. By economic measures or economic uh, uh, tools, you can really buy Hamas and you can really buy its ideology. For example, by giving Hamas permits for workers or giving them uh, money for salaries to the uh, to the uh, civil servants, uh, you can really make them more deterred and you can really uh, make them uh, 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 much more moderate. Another another uh, uh, layer of the, of the conceptia was that here in Israel we have all the measures in order to block any kind of offensive that will take place from the uh, from uh, from Gaza. We have great intelligence and we will have alarms uh, when when uh, when any kind of plan of Hamas will be promoted. And of course there is the fence that was built uh, for six years. And, uh, you know, uh, there will be no problems because the Hamas cannot get into tunnels because there are no tunnels. Finally, by the way, Hamas didn't use any tunnels. Uh, they used donkeys and Toyotas and, uh, and actually uh, made the, the, uh, the, uh, this fence, this iron and cement fence fall. And the last uh, layer of the, of the conceptia was that, uh, you know, the Palestinians, they are not not so important. They are not an obstacle uh, in the way of Israel. We are almost uh, 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 on the path uh, uh, of uh, of the uh, of, of opening uh, an embassy in Saudi Arabia. Uh, most of the Arab world they, they got tired from the Palestinians, and they can you know the Palestinians they're not important enough. And uh, this kind of argument was mainly uh, used by uh, political uh, decision makers. But this whole uh, whole uh, conceptia was also based about about uh, on on a very uh, uh, important, very strong uh, assumption that Hamas is very much uh, deterred from Israel, and Hamas will ha we, we, we doesn't have any any will or any plan to uh, to promote any kind of offensive against Israel. And now we must ask ourselves about the roots. Of the of the offensive, and you know when I'm asked about the reasons 
of the offensive, I really feel that several people that erase this question actually reflect the fact that we, we still don't understand Hamas. You know, Yehi Sinwar, the head of, uh, of Hamas in Gaza, he planned this offensive of, of October the 7th for a decade. This was, or this is, the mission of his life. It is based on ideological uh, vision, not on any real politic considerations. And Yehi Sanwar, his main goal was not to uh, undermine any attempts of uh, normalization between Saudi Arabia, not even to, to improve his image in the eyes of, uh, of uh, his own people. He's, he knew, this is my assessment, I assess that he knew that on October the 7th, he cannot defeat, he, he will not defeat Israel. But his long-term and deep goal was to undermine the basic layers of the Israeli society, to create uh, alienation between the society and the regime, and to create hostility for decades between Israelis and Palestinians. And you know, this, I, I mean, Yehi Sanwar, is the Palestinian uh, leader who really understands Israel. He spent 23 years in Israeli jail. And I do think that when I'm comparing him to other Hamas or, or other Palestinian leaders, he really understands the Jewish society and Israel. And uh, maybe he did have uh, uh, all kinds of achievements regarding this, uh, this goal. And now let's turn to the uh, to the uh, strategic balance of Hamas, actually of the Palestinian arena. You know, it's not it, it, it's quite uh, uh, clear that the uh, damage Hamas uh, and the Palestinians suffered since October the seventh it's unprecedented. We are speaking about really uh, many of Hamas military wing members and commanders that were killed. The, uh, the military infrastructure was uh, was uh, very uh, uh, in a very severe was was uh, was uh, damaged by uh, Israel. About half or third of uh, of Gaza territory was uh, till now is occupied by uh, by Israel, and of course of course broad territories inside Gaza were ruined by uh, by Israel. But although all those uh, negative. Uh, developments in the, from the eyes of Hamas, they consider the balance in a, in in other way, because Yehi Sanwar, when you will ask him about the price of the offensive, he will not say that he regrets about it. You know, uh, uh, people who lead who lead the uh, the uh, the uh, Islamic vision, they they never regret about nothing, and on the on 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 the opposite. He do think or he do assess that he also had dramatic or strategic achievements. He still exists, you know, after half a, half a year of, of, uh, of really uh, tough conflict. He, he's really right now the one who decides and, uh, and the, the one who leads Gaza. Uh, till now, there is no internal protest in, inside the, uh, the Palestinian society in, in Gaza Strip. And... He feels that he caused dramatic damage to Israel that uh, really undermined the uh, the society. Uh, I want to to say something, uh, some uh, some uh, words about uh, the Palestinian society, and then then turn to the uh, to the day after. You know, many people in Israel, I think that their basic political ideological opinion about the conflict, about the reasons of the conflict were really changed or even undermined after October the 7th. So, until October the 7th, many Israelis, by the way, including me, the main perception about the conflict was that there is Hamas. They oppose the, uh, the peace process. They want to promote only jihad. And there is the rest of the Palestinians, uh, the citizens who are not involved. And there is a very clear distinction between the two, uh, the two parts. You know, I think that since October the 7th, many Israelis discovered that this kind of image was quite twisted. First of all, you know, in, this, in the day of the massacre of October the 7th, not two or three, but dozens of thousands of civilians, Palestinian one, were involved in looting, killing, 
stealing corps of Israelis in the in the kibbutzim nearby the uh, nearby Gaza Strip. Uh, inside the Palestinian uh, uh, society of Gaza, half a year after this tough, dramatic, full of damages war began, you can hear zero criticism, I mean serious one, or protest, or any kind of soul searching uh, regarding uh, Hamas. Actually, Yehi Sanwar feels quite comfortable when he thinks about his internal arena. There is no, no, uh, no unrest or no criticism from this uh, arena. And, you know, we in Israel, we did understood that there is, a, there is a deep dehumanization of Israelis, uh, mainly when we heard the stories of, of the survi survivors of uh, Nova Party, of those, uh, or, or those who returned from, uh, from uh, prison. Uh, from the tunnels of Hamas. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do think that many people in Israel understood that the whole problem or the whole sources of the conflict is not only uh, uh, regard uh, the, uh, the occupation or any kind of economic uh, gaps between Palestinians and Israelis. We're speaking about consciousness, about minds. And it seems that right now there is, first of all, dramatic gap between Israelis and Palestinians regarding, uh, you know, how, how the two peoples interrupt uh, moral, truth, uh, values of uh, life, the other, and but also the, the main question about coexistence. It's it, We're speaking about dramatic, uh, dramatic uh, uh, gaps between the two uh, peoples. By the way, you can find the uh, expressions or reflections of uh, uh, these arguments in a, in a poll that was uh, committed by uh, Khalil Shikaki's uh, uh, institute and was published uh, a week ago. And uh, this poll, which is, I, I, I think, I assess that he is uh, quite uh, reliable, uh, shows that, first of all, about 71% of the Palestinians, they do support the offensive of, uh, of uh, uh, October the 7th. And when they are asked about, uh, do they believe that uh, war crimes were committed by Hamas? You can see the answers. Most of them, they, you know, they live in a very deep denial regarding the uh, the uh, the events of October the seventh. I spoke a lot with my Palestinian friends. You know, some of them they admit, but they cannot they cannot announce about it in a public uh, manner. That yeah, they they do believe that they were. Uh, 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 war crimes. The others, you know, they live in, in full denial. They really don't believe that any kind of monsters can get out of the Palestinian people. So we're, we, we're speaking about really dramatic gap that even if the war will end, I don't know how, how we can jump from this uh, uh, kind of uh, hostility and uh, consciousness gaps to coexistence or, or to solution, uh, uh, to, to states uh, solution. Now I would like to uh, end with the question about, uh, about uh, the future. And you know, I do uh, assess that among most of the Israelis, not all of them, most of them, there are two uh, collective conclusions after the, uh, the, uh, the current war, which was not ended uh, actually. First, and, and there is a contradiction between the two uh, conclusions. First is that basically Israelis and Palestinians, they cannot live in one entity with all, without really borders. You know, there are all kinds of ideas of Eretz Israel Ashlema, the one state uh, reality, uh, even it's even utopic ideas of, yeah, we will all, uh, sons of Abraham, we will sit under the olive tree and eat pita bread and uh, and uh, labane and, and olives and everything will be fine. No, I think that October the 7th proved us that nothing will be fine if there will be no borders and that uh, if there will be one state, it's going to be a Bosnian hell style, not any kind of utopic uh, entity. The other conclusion, and as I said before, it stands with a contradiction to the first one, is that 
actually, we understood on October the 7th that the deep meaning of Palestinian sovereignty or Palestinian independence is existential threat for Israel. I think that, and this is my, my personal opinion, I don't think that the, 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 the Palestinians right now are ready for sovereignty, for statehood. I think that, you know, they, they are too weak. They, uh, they are immature uh, uh, in order to, uh, to promote uh, or to have such a, such a goal. So I do think that in any kind of uh, future scenarios, and if there will be uh, uh, any kind of uh, Palestinian entity, even Palestinian state, it will be very important that the gates of this future entity will be controlled by Israel. For example, the Jordan Valley and what we call the Philadelphia Road, the border between Sinai and Gaza. The Palestinians cannot control those gates because those gates, uh, actually, they are the, uh, the basic measure of, uh, it was the basic measure of Hamas in order to promote more and more dramatic threats uh, in front of uh, Israel. And I do think that the main uh, target or of the, of the Zionist project will be to uh, analyze how to promote those two uh, uh, goals, how to put borders, I mean, physical one between the Palestinians and the Israelis, mainly in the West Bank, but of course also in Gaza, but on the same time, not to not to have any existential threats and as i as i mentioned before i do think that one of the keys in order to uh, make sure that there will be no kind of uh, threats is to keep that the gates of the future entity and personally i don't care if this entity will be called a state will be controlled by israel i don't know for how long i would like to end with the uh, with the question of the day after you know, this is the main question or one of the main question in Israel and actually in the whole world. Uh, during the last uh, last uh, uh, months, and we need to be frank enough with ourselves and admit that, there, that, you know, Israel doesn't stand in front of good and bad options and need to, to choose the good one. Israel stands in front of several negative, bad ideas scenarios and israel should uh, should they choose the least worst scenario uh, among them first of all there is the idea of the of uh, uh, controlling directly on the on the palestinians like uh, the uh, the situation that took place till uh, 1993 when the pa was established and uh, you know many people in the government for example smotrich and Bengvir, they, they don't want only to control directly Gaza Strip, they want also to re-establish the, uh, the settlements in this, uh, in this area. And of course, you know, there is dramatic, uh, enormous price, socially, military, uh, from the military point of view, of course, from the international point of view. And this is my assessment. I do assess that even the right-wing supporters, they do understand that this kind of scenario is very negative or will be very negative uh, for Israel. And the price of this kind of scenario from every, every aspect will be very high. There is the second scenario of actually creating a little Mogadishu, a little Somalia instead of Hamas uh, regime. You can get into Gaza, you can uh, really ruin the uh, regime and the military infrastructure of Hamas, but then to get out immediately. And the meaning is that a vacuum will be created in Gaza. And this kind of vacuum will be filled very quickly by, by even more crazy guys than Hamas. All kind of, you know, uh, ISIS style, Al-Qaeda, uh, groups, uh, uh, radical groups like that. And I do think that it's a very bad idea to have, uh, to have uh, 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 Syrian or Afghan-style Af entity uh, nearby uh, uh, the border, uh, the border, the southern border of Israel. There is the idea, a very popular one, of let's convince the PA to get back to Gaza. The main problem here, and once again, we must be frank enough to admit that the PA is very weak. 
the PA, the alienation between the public and the PA is, is dramatic. You know, according to the poll I showed before, 93% of the people in, in, in the West Bank, they do want to, uh, Abu Mazen to resign from his, uh, his uh, uh, current uh, position. And, you know, I, I, I even, after speaking with a lot of people in Ramallah, I even feel that there are many people in the PA who, really, who, doesn't re who don't really want this kind of uh, mission of responsibility because, you know, there are lack of confidence that they can really uh, implement this goal. And the last uh, alternative, and I must admit, once again, I'm full of, of question marks, and it's not ideal, but it's better than all the others, uh, is to create um, or to help the Palestinians to create local administration in Gaza based on local local players, uh, actors like uh, heads of uh, Fatah. And of course, we're speaking about the ruling party of the PA. Uh, all kind of uh, prominent uh, public leaders or prominent uh, academia figures or heads of clans. I'm not speaking about chieftaincies. You know, there is an idea here in Israel to create chieftaincies ruled by uh, clans, but I'm not speaking about, about it about this kind of uh, idea, I'm speaking about, about uh, local administration that will take care of the civil affairs and of the public uh, space in Gaza. I don't want that Israel will attempt to uh, catch uh, thieves or, uh, or uh, you know, uh, confront uh, demonstrations in uh, Gaza. And this is my assessment. And I really hope that I'm not mixing between wishful thinking and assessments, I do think that if, for example, this kind of entity will exist or survive for one or two or three years and will be able to, be, to function as an address for the Palestinians, maybe we, Israel can, could, can, in the future can also uh, 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 make this entity also responsible for security uh, uh, affairs uh, and maybe, but but it's not uh, in the uh, short term uh, future. Maybe we, we we in the few in in the long term future we we will all also be able to speak about political settlement. And of course, I I didn't mention that this entity that I described will have to be in a in a very strong linkage with the PA. I don't care if it will be called a, a, a part of the PA but it cannot be isolated or a separated entity from the West Bank. And uh, as I told you, I do think that we should be very, um, very realistic, not pessimistic, but, but very realistic, not to create any kind of uh, any illusions and not to believe that, you know, you can uh, implement total victory immediately and you can change dramatically the minds and the hearts of the Palestinians. It will take time. It's a uh, specific. Uh, uh, way, but uh, the most important thing is to be uh, realistic, uh, and uh, this is uh, my main uh, conclusion. Great. Thank you, Professor. We have a lot of questions, not so much time, but uh, I just want to start by first asking, you know, in order to get to the day after, we need to get to sort of the final day of this war, of this situation. This war has gone on far longer than anybody had imagined. As you've spoken, this is the longest war in Israel's history. You know, next next month, next month, April 6th, will be a six months of a war between Israel and Hamas that's still claiming many, many lives on both sides. What has to happen to end this war? How do we end this war to get to the day after? Yeah, and the main question, David, is, is there any end to uh -huh. this, uh, really end to this war? And, and you know, Professor, what, what, if you could please, if you could please stop sharing your screen. Sorry? Stop sharing your screen, please. If you oh, don't okay. Mind. Great. And then tell us, yeah, talk about this. How do we get to, to ending this war? So, uh, as, as I told you, David, first of all, we must, uh, and once again, we, we must be very, be very frank and very, very realistic. I do think that almost half a year after this war began, uh, Israel, the Israeli society, is, in, is actually facing a T-junction. There are only two options, not, not uh, several or three options. 
One option is to promote a deal regarding the hostages, to uh, release all the hostages. But the meaning of this kind of, of, uh, of an option, of, of an alternative, is that at least by now, we must, uh, we must recognize that Hamas is still uh, in control over Gaza, and we must end the war. I don't think that there, there is really, uh, you know, here in Israel, we created a new strategy, the third phase strategy. Uh, and, and, you know, after about three or four months of this strategy, we do understand that this kind of policy doesn't really promote uh, the collapse of Hamas regime and not the, the release of the, of the uh, uh, hostages. The other option, I spoke about one option. The other one is really to be serious when you are speaking about erasing the military and the regime capability, ca capacities of Hamas. The meaning is that you must occupy all Gaza Strip. You cannot really, you know, we saw it in Shifa Hospital. You cannot really um, get into one of the neighborhoods, uh, ruin all the, uh, destroy all the uh, military uh, infrastructure, and then get out of this area and believe that something positive will will develop, will be developed over there. Nothing will be developed. It will be filled quickly by Hamas or all kind of ISIS style groups. And uh, I do think that if Israel decided that, uh, yeah, we want to change dramatically the situation in Gaza, we must, uh, we must uh, uh, take control over all this area. But, you know, you, you analyze the military, uh, the military picture, the military situation right now. I don't think what, that uh, with about, uh, uh, it's less than a division. It's, it's uh, three, uh, three brigades in Gaza. You cannot really occupy Gaza. So, and this is, once again, this is my personal opinion. I do think that it's time to promote the, uh, the deal, the, the hostages uh, release. Uh, I don't think that there will be any other better time or, or any other better means to promote this goal. And uh, once again, it's my, my uh, personal opinion. Is, you know, in Israel itself, I haven't been to Israel since the war has begun, I'm going next week, but in Israel itself, um, there appears is there is there still this united idea that the hostages come first? Is there any is there any scenario in which uh, there is a end of the war without the returning of the hostages? And and how do we get these hostages back while still making sure that Hamas is defeated? And also, what is the tolerance level right now in Israel for releasing uh, Palestinian prisoners, many of whom? Have so much blood on their hand. Is there a willingness to say that? Have we gone to a point where we're willing to say we must bring the hostage, we must bring the Israeli hostages home by any means necessary? Yeah, you know, once again, David, uh, I'm 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 expressing my uh, personal uh, opinion and my personal uh, uh, assessments. I do assess that uh, the impact of the uh, of the uh, this topic the the hostages is may it, it becomes more and more important in the uh, in the uh, eyes of the israelis i do think and once again this is my assessment that many israelis agree today not all of them of course to release many heavy uh, prisoners you know we are speaking a lot about for example marwan barghouti which is, uh, he, he's from Fatah, he's not from Hamas. But when we're speaking about heavy prisoners that will be released, for example, we're speaking about him because he can be the next president after Abu Mazen. But I do, I do feel that there are many Israelis that, you know, they really agree that, okay, if there is any need to release uh, Israelis, Jews, from the, uh, from the hands of, of, the, of Hamas, Okay, we 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 need that uh, that this is the price that uh, that we must uh, pay, and that, that's okay. of course it's not okay. It's very difficult, but uh, we are ready to to uh, to do it. And uh, you know, for, I, I on last Saturday I was in the uh, it wasn't a demonstration. It was uh, you know uh, like a broad meeting in uh, in what we call the hostages square in the Tel Aviv uh, uh, museum. And you know there were dozens of thousands of Israelis. They were not demonstrators against the government. They didn't say nothing against uh, Netanyahu. They only said the main goals of the Zionist project 
is not only to erase or to eradicate our enemies from earth, but also to protect the life of Jews here in Israel. And yeah, maybe we, we will have to do a very tough, difficult choice, but uh, right now it seems that the dilemma is very hard and we must choose the life of the people. It's much more important than other considerations. You spoke a lot about uh, the support for Hamas by the Palestinians, both in Gaza and in the West Bank. It's clear that in many ways, the Palestinians have been heavily radicalized. Is there a way to de-radicalize them? Is there a way to de-Hamasify the Palestinians so that we have a partner to work with? Yeah, you know, uh, David, this was one of the prominent points in the document that uh, Netanyahu published a month ago about the day after in Gaza, de-radicalization of Gaza. And, you know, I think that here in Israel, we should learn from the American experience uh, in Iraq and in Afghanistan, uh, because I, you know, I do think that in the Middle East, first of all, you cannot really uh, change the minds of the people if they themselves don't want or they do not commit any soul searching. You cannot get into their minds and, pull, uh, and, and you know, erase all kind of problematic negative elements and put, put a, a positive one. You know, I do think that we should start this uh, this uh, uh, goal, I mean, the, the change of consciousness. And of course, you know, the main places or the main sites that should be treated are, for example, textbooks, universities, media, the religious institution. But we must we also must be realistic enough to understand that it will be very tough if, if there will be no Palestinian player that will be will promote this soul searching like Germany after 45, it, it, it will be useless because, you know, it will end like Iraq and Afghanistan with nothing. And uh, we should start with this project. But we, once again, the, the main problem, the, the, the key uh, word here is being realistic. Uh, this is very important. One of the most, I think, heartening uh, outcomes since October 7th is one of the most, um, you know, uh, things that, that beneficial or surpri surprisingly beneficial things is that um, we've seen a unification uh, of Israeli Arabs with the general Jewish population. Israeli Arabs have remained loyal to the state, which is quite surprising. Um, number one, how likely is that loyalty to stand as this war continues? Do we do we do we uh, believe that Israeli Arabs will continue to remain close to the state? Um, could they begin to become um, turn and, and support Hamas? Also, in this in this sort of uh, post uh, uh, October seventh post post war scenario, what is the role of Israeli Arabs? Because there's a lot of them. There's two million Israeli, almost two million Israeli Arabs. So, what is their role here, and 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 how will their loyalty uh, continue to be tested? Very important uh, point, even strategic. Uh... Uh, point from Israeli point of view, you know. First of all, David, I do do. Uh, it's not uh, it's not assessment. It's knowledge that Yichis in war is very much frustrated from the fact that there was no inflaming uh, or no uh, unrest among the uh, Israeli Arabs like uh, the demonstration, the riots that took place on October or on May twenty one. I, I assess that Yechi Sinwa, when he started this war, he thought that immediately Lud and Ramle and Haifa and Nazareth and, and the Negev will be all, all in uh, one big uh, uh, inflaming. And uh, he was wrong. And I think that when you're trying to check what uh, were the reasons for this relatively calm situation, there are two reasons for that. First of all, we must remember that on October the 7th, 24 Israeli Arabs, Israeli Arab citizens were killed by Hamas. You know, not only for from rockets, but also uh, there were many videos that uh, that many Israelis uh, uh, Israelis uh, saw in the social media of Nukba. You know, the elite uh, the elite forces of Hamas coming to uh, to uh, Bedouin citizens, uh, taking them out of, of the cars, investigating them, and then executing them. I mm -hmm. think that after, you know, watching, uh, I mean, the Israeli Arabs watching all those videos, they were in total shock because of uh, because of those uh, those uh, uh, sides. And uh, 
the other reason for this uh, relatively calm situation is the fear. You know, immediately after October the 7th, every Arab citizen, citizen who wrote something, let's call it problematic, uh, on the social media, you know, affiliating with Hamas or affiliating with, uh, with the offensive, was immediately arrested. Uh, the police was very tough, and many Israeli Arabs really feared from revenge. Uh, but, you know, we, we he, today, I mean, Israelis and Jew, uh, Jews and Arabs here in Israel, uh, six months after the, uh, the war began, I don't think that uh, things are, are, are okay between the two communities. There is a deep alienation. You know, here in, in Israeli cities and in, in, Isra and in Arab cities inside Israel, you see less Jews and less Arabs. You know the all the uh, the uh, contacts, the human, the the personal daily contacts were reduced dramatically, and I do I, I I do afraid. You know I'm very much concerned that if, for example, the cut of the budgets to the uh, uh, Arab sector uh, will continue, and if the uh, crime and the and the violence among the Arabs, which right now the rate once again is very high. Uh, will uh, this kind of uh, of uh, attitude will will continue? I I'm very afraid that uh, the calm situation will not continue, and we will see uh, all kind of uh, you know uh, uh, clashes, mm -hmm. even uh, even violent one be between the Arabs and the state, and between the two communities. And I really hope that the government will be uh, clever enough to avoid uh, avoid uh, such a uh, such uh, uh, scenarios, you know, I must mention only one thing. Among the Israeli Arabs, there is one prominent leader. His name is Mansour Abbas. He's the head of Ram, the uh, party that uh, took part uh, in the uh, former coalition. He is one of the, the only Muslim Arab leaders between the uh, Atlantic Ocean and the Arab Gulf that immediately on October the 7th said that this is not Islam. Hamas is a terror organization, and Hamas committed war crimes. And I think it's very unique, and many Israelis, Jews, really appreciate it. We're going to go a bit a bit longer because of our uh, technical interruption. So I have one more question, then we'll turn it over to the audience. But um, one thing I'm very curious about um, is the fact that there has been almost no opposition in the Gaza Strip uh, by the locals to Hamas. There's been no kind of protest. There's been no sort of out, uh, up, uprising. Um, we have seen, you know, sporadic uh, it, videos of, of, you know, old ladies screaming that Hamas is dogs and things like that, but nothing really organized. Um, you know, is there any scenario when where the population of Gaza, uh, who civilians outnumber Hamas tremendously, is there a scenario where the population of Gaza kind of wakes up one day and says we've had enough? And and is there a is there a mechanism for there to for them to take control of their own destiny? Yeah, you know, uh, it also regards David to to, to the uh, concepts I spoke before because before October the seventh, one of the main uh, uh, the main arguments among Israeli decision makers was that if Hamas will promote any kind of escalation. The, the cities, uh, the, the society, the public, the 17,000 workers that uh, that are getting their salaries, salaries from Israel, they will rebel. They will they will uh, protest against Hamas. And actually, nothing happened. Uh, there is, as I mentioned before, there is zero criticism. And you know, I I I am really trying also to to ask my friends in Gaza, what is the reason for this bizarre. Uh, behavior. You know, uh, many of them, you know, they say, yeah, you know, people are really afraid if you will say something against Sinwar or uh, El Qassam brigades, they will immediately execute you. And, you know, I feel that th th this kind of answer is quite limited mm -hmm. because when you, you check deeply the public discourse, the political discourse, by the way, not only in Gaza, but also in the West Bank, mm -hmm. you see that it is not only a matter of fear. This is on, also a matter of solidarity. Many people are really affiliated with Hamas. You saw the polls. Many of them think that the offensive of October the 7th was, uh, you know, victorious, uh, uh, great moment of the Palestinian people. 
And, uh, you know, I, I do assess that Yerhi Sinwar right now, he's not 100% uh, confident that nothing will happen. You know, he saw uh, the Arab Spring uh, for a decade, and he understands that, that you need sometimes only one spark in order to cause great inflame. But he, right now, and this is my assessment, he thinks that, uh, you know, the people of Gaza, they do consider Israel as the is their greatest enemy, not me. I'm still the defender uh, of the people. And, uh, you know, I, I really hope that there will be a protest, a broad one against him. This is the, the moment, I think, that will be very important, not for Israel, but for the Palestinians to uh, define themselves as a social society, as a social, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 public and when you when you speak about the 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 support for Hamas amongst the Palestinians, amongst the community Gazans, but also in the West Bank, is it is it primarily a nationalistic support? Are they supporting Hamas as a nationalistic entity? Because Hamas is also a religious fundamentalist entity. So is there I mean, how much of religion of Islam plays into this? Because that would be to me in some ways even more intractable than the nationalism is the Islam. You know, it's even funny, uh, David, because when I, I ask Palestinians uh, this question, uh, is Hamas is more religious or more, uh, you know, Palestinian nationalist? They, they tell me we, we don't understand the question. You know, from, from our point of view, it, it's both. You know, yeah, they are Palestinian and Islamistic uh, in the same time. And there is no contradiction and there is no, you know, tension or priorities between the two identities. So, uh, you know, I, I do think that, for example, it's very different, uh, uh, for example, regarding the Islamic Jihad, because the Islamic Jihad, which is much more, much smaller uh, organization, I can consider him much more uh, Islam, Islamic uh, uh, organization than a nationalist Palestinian one. But regarding Hamas, when we're speaking about their uh, activities, their uh, their image in the eyes of the Palestinians, they they are both. They are the representatives of uh, the uh, the political Islam in the Palestinian arena, and they are Palestinians. They do prom they, they do promote the uh, basic uh, ideas or the basic goals of all of us, of all the Palestinians. So. I, I do think that you know uh, th those two uh, identities they live in the same in the same entity or the same situation in the same time. That's very chilling and very concerning. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, you know, okay. Uh, we have a few questions here. We don't have that much time, but um, uh, Rafia, um, what is the story with Rafia? Obviously, Netanyahu seems committed to going in, but um, he hasn't yet. Uh, yeah. Talk about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Rafah, uh, Rafah uh, problem. I, I'm trying to make a distinction between the images and the slogans and reality. Because, for example, when you check the slogans of the, the politician, they all say, yeah, we must, uh, you know, uh, uh, get into Rafah and uh, then put an end to the four battalions of Hamas in Rafah. And this will be the beginning of the new, new situation in Gaza. But, you know, unfortunately, it, it, you know, it, it's much more uh, wishful thinking than, 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 uh, than reality. Because I think that even if Israel will get into Gaza and will cause severe damage to the four battalions of Hamas, I don't think that Hamas will be vanished. You know, we saw it in the northern, par in the northern parts of Gaza. We uh, really caused the severe damage to the uh, to the battalions in Jebalia and in uh, in uh, uh, Rimal and Shati, but once again, you know, we're speaking about a very flexible uh, organization that can immediately uh, make uh, adjustment to any kind of uh, changes. And uh, the main issue regarding Rafah, and the, I, I think that the Israeli Hasbara should uh, should uh, really uh, 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 focus. Or uh, or uh, or make th this point more clear is that we are not speaking about taking control over Rafiq city itself, but uh, over the road between Kerem Shalom and and the uh, the sea uh, the shore uh, of uh, Rafah, 
In order to change dramatically the situation in Gaza itself, you must take control over this uh, strip uh, of the border between Sinai and Gaza, the gate between Gaza and the world. Uh, and, you know, I, I do think that uh, Netanyahu should be focused on this mission. In order to promote this mission, you must get uh, uh, agreements with the Egyptians, very, very uh, close coordination with the Egyptians and with the American uh, administration. But we, you know, only speaking about the very general slogans of, yeah, after Rafah, a new reality will be created. It's it's an illusion, you know. Uh, it's not serious enough, I think. Great. We have time for one more question. Speaking about new realities, let's talk about UNRWA. UNRWA. Um, they've uh, you know they've been exposed for the terror supporting organization fraud sham uh, lie that they are. Uh, yet they still exist. They're still being funded. Do you think we're going to see a fundamental shift in UNRWA at the end of this war? Have has there is there a day coming to an end, or is it just going to be business as usual? You know, it's it's very very complicated uh, question. First of all, David, we must remember that you know there are five arenas of activity uh, of UNRWA. Gaza is only one of them. We're speaking also about the West Bank, Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan. And Israel has a uh, has zero impact on what is happening in Syria or, or Jordan. In Gaza. You know, I do hope that there will be uh, a new order without UNRWA because it it is quite clear that UNRWA, you know, we are always uh, we are very much focused on the involvement of UNRWA's uh, 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 UNRWA's members in uh, terror activities. But the main problem is with UNRWA is also the education system of UNRWA. You know, they do uh, 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 have a very they they do have a very a broad influence on the consciousness of the young generation. And actually they preserve the hostility and they preserve the uh, memory of the of the Nakba, of the 48 uh, uh, catastrophe in the minds of the of the Palestinians. Uh, I really hope that Israel uh, will promote changes. Of course, once again, as in the day after in Gaza and and, and, and the same thing with the, with the issue of Rafah, we need to have a strategy. Right now, Israel doesn't really have any clear strategy. And if you will have clear strategy, you will also have coordination, cooperation with the American administration. You cannot, you can do nothing regarding UNRWA without really a, a very, a very tight cooperation with the American administration. And I really hope that our government will be clever enough not to uh, have any any further crisis with uh, with uh, the uh, the administration in Washington Washington but to promote clear strategy and of course very very uh, close cooperation with the Americans uh yes uh i want to i want to thank you professor for this fantastic thank you. time together i mean it's it's been I wish we had more more time to talk, especially to talk about the U.S. To talk about what happened yesterday with the U.N. Um, I just want to, yeah, to to say thank you um, for being so generous with your time, for sharing your insight and knowledge with everyone. Thank you to the friends around the world for making time to join us today. Our Tel Aviv University friends, your support at Tel Aviv University in Israel is critical in laying the foundation for the country as they pick up the pieces and continue to rebuild from the horrors of October 7th and the war that's come after. I'd like to note that there are over 2,500 Tel Aviv University students still serving in the reserves. And of course, we pray for the swift return of the hostages and the end to this war. Uh, a copy of today's webinar can be found at aftau.org. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, uh, Tel Aviv University. Thank you. And um, thank you. Thank you for having me. And once again, I apologize for the uh, problem, the technical uh, problem we had in the beginning. That's okay. These things happen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. All the best.